Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again. It's a Wednesday at 4 Eastern, and in the world of enterprise technology, that means it's time once again for Hot Technologies. Yes, indeed. Presented by the Blur Group, of course, powered by our friends at Techopedia. And the topic for today is a really cool one. Uh, better to ask permission, best practices for privacy and security. That's right. It's kind of a tough topic. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, but it's a pretty serious one. And it's really getting more serious every day, quite frankly. It's a grave issue in many ways. For many organizations, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what you can do to protect your organization from the nefarious characters that seem to be all over the place these days. So today's presenters, we have Vicki Harp calling in from IDERA. You can see IDERA software on LinkedIn. I love the new functionality in LinkedIn, although I can tell they're pulling some strings in certain ways, not allowing you to access people, trying to get you to buy those premium memberships. But there you go. We have our very own Robin Bloor dialing in. He's actually in San Diego area these, this today. And yours truly as your moderator slash analyst. So what are we talking about? Data breaches. I just took this information from identityforce.com. It's already off to the races. We're in May, of course, of this year, and there are just a ton of data breaches. There are some really huge ones, of course, like Yahoo was a big one. Uh, we heard about, of course, the U.S. government being hacked. We just had the French elections hacked. This is happening all over the place. It's continuing, and it's not going to stop. So it is a reality. It's the new reality, as they say. We really do need to think about ways to enforce the security of our systems and of our data. And uh, it's an ongoing process. So I took some time to think about all the different issues that come into play. And this is just a partial list, but this gives you some perspective on just how precarious the situation is these days with enterprise systems. And before the show, in our pre-show banter, we were talking about ransomware, which has hit somebody I know. It's a very unpleasant experience when someone takes over your iPhone and demands money to, for you to get back access to your phone. But it happens. It happens to computers. It happens to systems. I saw just the other day it's happening to billionaires with their yachts. And imagine going to your yacht one day, trying to impress all your friends, and you can't even turn it on because some thief has stolen access to the controls, to the control panel. I just said the other day in an interview to someone, always have the manual override. <laughs> like, I'm not a big fan of all the connected cars because even cars can be hacked. Anything that's connected to the Internet or connected to a network that can be penetrated can be hacked, anything. So here are just a few items to consider in terms of framing the context of how serious the situation is. Web-based systems are everywhere these days. They continue to proliferate. How many people buy stuff online? It's just through the roof these days. That's why Amazon is such a powerful force these days, because so many people are buying stuff online. So you remember back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people were pretty nervous about putting their credit card into a web form to get their information. And back then, the argument was, well, if you hand your credit card to a waiter at a restaurant, isn't that the same thing? And the short answer is yes, it is the same thing. There were all of these control points or access points, same thing, different side of the same coin, where people can be put into jeopardy, where someone can take your money, where someone can steal from you. Then IoT, of course, expands the threat escape, I love that word, by orders of magnitude. I mean, think about it. With all these new devices everywhere, if someone can hack into a system that controls them, they can turn all those bots against you and cause lots and lots of problems. So that's a very serious issue. We have a global economy these days, which expands the threatscape even more. And what's more, you have people in other countries who can access the web the same way you and I can. And uh, if you don't know how to speak Russian or you know any number of other languages, you're going to have a hard time understanding what's going on when they hack into your system. So we have advances in networking and virtualization. Well, that's, that's good. But I have on the right-hand side of this picture here a sword. And the reason I have it there is because every sword cuts both ways. Uh, it's a double-edged sword, as they say, and the, it's an old cliche, but it means that a sword I have can harm you or it can harm me, can come back to harm me, either by bouncing back or by someone taking it. There's actually one of Aesop's fables that says the, that we often give our enemies the tools of our own destruction. It's really a quite compelling storyline, and it has to do with someone who used a bow and arrow and shot down a bird, and the bird saw as the arrow was coming up that it, feathers from one of its foul friends were on the edge of the arrow, on the, on the back of the arrow, to guide it. And he thought to himself, oh, man, here it is. My own feathers from my own family are going to be used to take me down. Well, that happens all the time. 
you hear statistics about if you have a gun in the house, the thief can take the gun. Well, this is all true. So I'm throwing this out there as an analogy just to consider all of these different developments have positive sides and negative sides. And speaking of, containers. For those of you who really follow the cutting edge of enterprise computing, containers are the latest thing, the latest way to deliver functionality. It's really the, the marriage of virtualization and the service-oriented architecture, at least for microservices. And it's very interesting stuff. You can certainly obfuscate your security protocols and your application protocols and your data and so forth by using containers. And that, that gives you an advance for a period of time. But sooner or later, the bad guys are going to figure that out, and then it's going to be even harder to prevent them from taking advantage of your systems. So there's that. There's mobile workforce, which complicates the network and security and where people are logging in from. <clears throat> We've got the browser wars that continue apace that require constant work to update and to stay on top of things. We keep hearing about the old Microsoft Explorer browsers, how there are hacks available in there. So there's more money to be made in hacking these days. It's a whole industry. This is something that my partner, Dr. Bloor, taught me eight years ago. I was wondering, why are we seeing so much of it? And he, he reminded me it's a whole industry involved in hacking. And in that sense, the narrative, which is one of my least favorite words, about security is really very dishonest because the narrative shows you in all these videos and anytime the news covers some hacking, they show some guy in a hoodie sitting in his basement in a dark lit room. That's not at all the case. That is not at all representative of reality. Loan hacker, there, there are very few loan hackers. They're out there. They're causing some trouble. They're not going to cause the big trouble because they can't make a whole lot of money. So what happens is the hackers come in, penetrate your system, and then sell that access to someone else who turns around and sells it to someone else. And then somewhere down the line, somebody exploits that hack and takes advantage of you. And there are countless ways to take advantage of stolen data. So I've even been marveling to myself about how we've been glamorizing this concept. You see this term everywhere, growth hacking, like it's a good thing. Growth hacking, well, you know, hacking can be a good thing if you're trying to work for the good guys, so to speak, and hack into a system, like we keep hearing about with North Korea and their missile launches potentially being hacked. Well, that's good, but hacking is often a bad thing. So now we're glamorizing it almost like Robin Hood. We glamorize Robin Hood. And then there's a cashless society, something that frankly concerns the daylights out of me. All I think every time I hear that is, no, please don't do it. Please don't. I don't want all of our money to disappear. So these are just some issues to consider. And again, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. It's never going to stop. There will always be a need for security protocols and for advancing security protocols and for monitoring your systems, for even knowing and sensing who's out there but the understanding being it could even be an inside job. So it's an ongoing issue. It's going to be an issue for quite some time. Make no mistake about that. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bloor, who can share with us some thoughts about securing databases. Robin, take it away. OK. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, one of the interesting hacks, I think it occurred about five years ago, but basically it was a card processing company that was hacked and uh, a large number of card details were stolen. But the interesting thing about it to me was the fact that it was the test database that they actually got into. Uh, and it was probably the case that they had a great more, uh, a great deal of difficulty getting into the um, the, the actual real pro uh, database of processing cards. But you know how it is with developers. You know, they just take a cut of a database, throw it in there. They would have had to have been far more vigilant to have stopped that. But there's lots of interesting hacking stories. It makes it, in, in one area, it makes it a very interesting subject. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to actually, in, in one way or another, repeat some of the things that Eric said. but. It's easy to think of data security as a static target. It's easier because it's just easier to analyze static situations and then think of putting defenses here and defenses there. But it isn't. It's a moving target. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of defines the whole of the security space. It's um, just in the way that all technology evolves, the, uh, the technology of the bad guys evolves as well. So a brief overview, data theft is nothing new. In actual fact, espionage is data theft, and that's been going on for yeah, thousands of years, I think. The biggest um, data heist uh, in those terms was the 
the British breaking the German codes and the Americans breaking the Japanese codes, and pretty much in both instances they shortened the war very considerably, uh, and they were just stealing useful and valuable data. But it was very clever, of course, but you, you know what's going on right now is is very clever in lots of ways. Cyber Cyber Fest was born with the internet and exploded around 2005. I went and looked at all of the stats, and when you started to get the really serious and in some way or other um, remarkably high numbers starting about 2005, it's just got worse since then. Many players, governments are involved, businesses are involved, hacker groups, individuals. I went to Moscow, um, that must have been about five years ago, and I actually spent a lot of time with a guy from the UK who was researching the whole of the hacking space. And he said that, um, and I have no idea whether this is true, I've only got his word for it, but it sounds very likely, that in, um, in Russia there's something called the Business Network, which is a group of hackers that are all, you know, they they came out of the um, uh, the uh, ruins of the KGB, uh, and they sell themselves. Not just, I mean, I'm sure the Russian government uses them, but they sell themselves to anyone. And it was rumored, or he said, it was rumored that various foreign governments were using the um, the business network for plausible deniability. These guys had, you know, networks of millions of um, compromised PCs that they could attack from. Uh, and they had um, uh, all the tools you can imagine, you know. So the technology of attack and defense evolve, um, and businesses have a duty of care over their, da uh, their data, whether they own it or not. Uh, and that's starting to become much clearer in terms of the various pieces of um, regulation that are actually already in force or coming into force, uh, and likely to in improve. Somebody's you know, in one way or another, somebody has got to bear the cost of hacking in such a way that they are incented to close down the possibility. That's one of the things, I guess, that is necessary. Um, so about the hackers, they can be located anywhere, particularly within your organization. An awful lot of the ingenious hacks that I've heard of involved somebody opening a door. You know, the, the person, it's like the, the bank robber situation, nearly always they used to say, um, in good bank robberies, there's an insider, but the insider only needs to give out information, so it's difficult to get them to know who it was, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, uh, the, it may be difficult to bring them to justice because, you know, if you've been hacked by a group of people in Moldova, even if you know it was that group, how are you going to make some kind of a legal event happen around them? It's kind of, you know, from one um, jurisdiction to another, it's just there isn't a very good set of international arrangements to um, pin down the hackers. <coughs> um, they share technology and information, a lot of it's open source. If you want to, uh, you know, if you want to build your own virus, there's loads of virus kits out there, completely open source. Um, and they have considerable resources, there's been a number of, have had botnets of in, in more than a million um, compromised devices in data centers and in, um, you know, on PCs and so on. Um, some are profitable businesses that have been going for a long time, and then there's government groups, as I mentioned. Um, it's unlikely, as Eric said, it's unlikely this phenomenon is ever going to end. Um, so this is an interesting hack. I just thought I'd mention it because it's a fairly recent hack. It happened last year. There was a vulnerability in the DAO contract associated with the Ethereum um, uh, crypto coin. Um, and it was discussed in a forum, and within a day, the DAO contract was hacked. Using that vulnerability precisely, $50 million in Ether was siphoned off, causing an immediate crisis in the DAO project and closing it down. And uh, the, the e Ethereum actually fought to try and keep the hacker from um, uh, access to the money, and they, they kind of reduced his take, but it was also believed, not known for sure, that the hacker actually shorted the price of Ether prior to his attack, knowing that the price of Ether would collapse <coughs> and thus made a profit in another way. And, and that's another, if you like, stratagem that the hackers can use. If they can damage your share price and they know they'll do that, then it's only necessary for them to short the share, share price and, um, uh, and do the hack. Uh, 
you know. So it's it's kind of these guys are smart, you know. And the prizes: outright theft of money, uh, disruption and ransom, including um, includes investments where you disrupt and um, short the stock, sabotage, identity theft, all sorts of scams, just for the sake of advertising. Um, uh, that tends to be political. Um, for obviously information spying, and there are even people that make a living out of uh, the bug bounties that you can take by, you know, trying to hack Google, Apple, Facebook. Um, uh, even the Pentagon actually gives bug bounties, and you just hack if it's successful, then you just go and claim your prize, uh, and no damage is done. So that's a nice thing, you know. Um, mention, I might as well mention compliance and regulation. Um, aside from sector initiatives, there's loads of um, official regulations. HIPAA, SOX, FISMA, FERPA, and JLBA are all U.S. Uh, legislation. There are standards. PCI, DSS has become a fairly general standard. Um, uh, and then there's the ISO 17799 uh, about data ownership. Um, national regulations differ country to country, even in Europe. Uh, and currently, the GDPR, the Global Data, um, uh, what does it stand for? Global uh, Data Protection Regulation, I think it stands for. But that's um, coming into force next year, said to. Um, and the interesting thing about it is it applies across the world. If you've got 5,000 or more customers who you've got personal information on, and they live in Europe, then Europe will actually um, take you to task no matter where your corporation is actually headquartered or where it operates. And the, um, the uh, uh, penalties, the maximum penalty is 4% of annual revenue, which is just huge, you know. So that will be an interesting twist on the world when that comes into force. Um, things to think about, well, DBMS vulnerabilities, most of the valuable data is actually sitting in databases. You know, it's valuable because we put an awful lot of time into making it available and organizing it well, and that makes it more vulnerable um, if you don't actually apply the right DBMS securities. Um, uh, the, obviously, if you're going to plan for things like this, you need to identify what vulnerable data is throughout the organization, bearing in mind that data can be vulnerable for different reasons. You know, it can be customer data, but it could equally be, you know, internal documents that would be valuable for espionage purposes and so on. Um, uh, the security policy, particularly in relation to access security, which in recent times has been, in my opinion, very weak in the new open source stuff. Uh, encryption is coming more into use because it's pretty rock solid. Um, the cost of a security breach, most people didn't know, but if you actually look at what's happened with organizations that have suffered security breaches, it turns out that the cost of a security breach is often way higher than you think it would be. Uh, and then the other thing to think about is the attack surface because any piece of software anywhere working, uh, running within your organization presents an attack surface. So do the devices. So does the data, no matter how it's stored. It's all, you know, the attack surface is growing with the Internet of Things. The attack surface is probably going to double. So finally, DBA and data security. Data security is usually part of the DBA's role. But it's collaborative, too. And it needs, needs to be subject to corporate policy, otherwise, well, otherwise, it will probably not be implemented well. Having said that, I think I can pass the ball. All right, let me give the keys to Vicki. And you can share your screen or move through these slides. It's up to you. Take it away. No, I'll, I'll start with these slides. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I just wanted to take a quick moment and introduce myself. I'm Vicki Harp. I'm a, a manager of product management for SQL products at IDERA Software. And uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with us, um, IDERA uh, has a, a number of product lines, but uh, I'm, I'm here kind of uh, speaking for the SQL Server side of things. And so we, we do performance monitoring, security compliance, backup administration tools. And this is kind of a listing of them. And of course, what I'm here to talk about today is security and compliance. But the bulk of what I'm wanting to talk about today is not necessarily our products, so I do, do intend to show some uh, examples of that later. I wanted to talk to you more about um, database security, uh, some of the threats in in 
the world of database security right now, some things to think about and some of the introductory ideas of what you need to be looking at in order to secure your SQL Server databases and also to make sure that they are uh, compliant with the regulatory framework that you may be subject to. Um, uh, as was mentioned, there, there are many different uh, regulations in place. They're, they go on, you know, different uh, different industries, different places around the world, and these are all things to be thinking about. So uh, I kind of want to take a moment and talk about the state of data breaches and uh, not to, to repeat too much of what was already been discussed here. Um, I was looking over this Intel security research study recently, and uh, across their, I think, 1,500 or so organizations they spoke with, uh, they had an average of six security breaches uh, in terms of a, a data loss breaches, uh, and 68% of those had required disclosure in some sense, you know, so they affected the the stock price or, you know, they had to uh, do some credit monitoring for their customers or their employees, et cetera. Some interesting uh, other statistics is that internal actors were responsible for 43% of those. So a lot of people do think uh, a great deal about hackers and these kind of shady, uh, you know, quasi-governmental organizations or organized crime, et cetera, but internal actors are still uh, directly taking action against uh, their employers in in a pretty high proportion of, of the cases, and, and these are sometimes harder to protect against because people may have legitimate reasons to have access to that data. Uh, about half of that 43% was accidental loss in, in some sense, so for example, um, the case where somebody took data home and then lost track of that data, which leads me to the third point, which is that theft of physical media was still involved in 40% of the breaches. So that USB keys, that's people's laptops, uh, that's actual media that was burned onto physical disks and taken out of the building. Uh, if you think about, you know, do you have a developer who has a dev copy of your production database on their laptop? then they go get on a plane and they get off the plane and they get their check baggage and their laptop is stolen. You've now had a data breach. You may not necessarily think that that's why that laptop was taken. It might not ever show up in the wild, but that's still something that counts as a breach. It's going to require disclosure. You're going to have all of the downstream effects of having lost that data just because of the, the loss of that physical media. And uh, the other interesting thing is that a lot of people are thinking about credit data and credit card information as being the most valuable, but that's not really the case anymore. Um, that that data is valuable. Credit card numbers are, are useful, but honestly, that those numbers are changed very quickly, whereas people's personal data isn't changed very quickly. Uh, something that you know, a recent news item, relatively recent, a VTech, a toy maker, had uh, these toys that were designed for children, and uh, so people would, they'd have their kids' names, they'd have information about where their kids lived, they had their parents' names, they had photographs of the children. None of that was encrypted because it wasn't considered to be important, but their passwords were encrypted. Well, then whenever the breach inevitably happened, you're saying, okay, so I have a list of people, children's names, their parents' names, where they live, all of this information is out there, and you're thinking that the password was the most valuable part of that? It wasn't. People can't change those aspects about their personal data, you know, their address, et cetera. And so that information is actually very valuable and it needs to be protected. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the uh, things that are going on to, to contribute to the the way that data breaches are happening right now. One of the big hotspot spaces right now, right now is uh, so social engineering. So people call it phishing, you know, there's impersonation, et cetera, where people are getting access to data often through internal actors um, by just convincing them that they're supposed to have access to it. So uh, just the other uh, day, we had this Google Docs worm that was going around and it, what it would happen, and I actually received a copy of it, though fortunately, um, I didn't click on it. You would get an email from a colleague saying, here's a Google Doc link, you need to click on this to view what I just shared with you. Well, that in an organization that uses Google Docs, that's very conventional. You're going to get dozens of those requests a day. If you clicked on it, it would ask you for, for permission to, to access this document. And maybe you'd say, hey, that looks a little strange, but you know, it, it looks legit as well, so I'll go ahead and click on it. And as soon as you did that, you were giving this third party access to all of your Google documents. And so creating this link for this external actor to have access to all of your documents on Google Drive. This wormed all over the place. It hit 
hundreds of thousands of people in a matter of hours. And this was fundamentally a phishing attack um, that, uh, you know, Google itself ended up having to shut down because it was it was very well executed. People fell for it. Uh, in I mentioned here the Snapchat HR breach. Uh, this was just a simple matter of someone emailing, impersonating that they were the CEO, emailing to the HR department saying, I need you to send me the spreadsheet. And they believed them, and they put a spreadsheet with 700 different employees' compensation information, their home addresses, et cetera, emailed it to this other party, it wasn't actually the CEO. Now that data was out, and all of their employees' personal private information was, was out there and available for exploitation. Um, so social engineering is something that uh, I mention it in the world of databases because this is something that you can try to defend against through education. Uh, but you have to also just remember that anywhere that you have a person interacting with your uh, technology, and if you're relying on their good judgment to prevent an outage, um, you're asking a lot of them. People make mistakes. People click on things that they shouldn't have. People fall for uh, clever ruses, and you can try very hard to protect them against it, but it, it's not a strong enough. You need to try to limit the ability for people to accidentally give out this information uh, in your database systems. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that obviously we're talking about a lot is ransomware, botnets, viruses, all of these different automated ways. And so what I think is important to understand about ransomware is it really changes the, the profit model for attackers. In the case that you're talking about a, a breach, they have to, in some sense, extract data and have it for themselves and make use of it. And if your data is obscure, if it's encrypted, if it's you know industry specific, maybe they don't have any value for it. Up until this point, people may have felt like that was a protection for them. You know, I don't need to protect myself from uh, a data breach because if they were to get into my system, all they're going to have is, you know, I'm a photography studio. I have a list of who's going to be coming on what days for the next year. Who cares about that? Well, it turns out the answer is you care about that. You are storing that information. It's your business critical information. So using ransomware, an attacker will say, well, nobody else is going to give me money for this, but you will. So they leverage the fact that they don't even have to get the data out. They don't even have to have a breach. They just need to use security tools offensively against you. They get into your database. They encrypt the contents of it. And then they say, okay, we have the password and you're going to have to pay us $5,000 to get that password or else you just don't have this data anymore. And people do pay up. Uh, they find themselves having to do that. Um, MongoDB had kind of a huge problem uh, a couple months ago, I guess it was in January, where uh, ransomware hit, I think, over a million uh, MongoDB uh, databases that had been public to the internet ba based on some default settings. And what made it even worse is that people were paying and so other organizations would come in and re-encrypt or claim to have been the ones who originally have encrypted it. So when you paid your uh, money, and I think that in that case they were asking for something like $500, people would say, okay, I would pay more than that to get a researcher in here to help me figure out what went wrong. I'll just pay the $500. And they weren't even paying it to the right actor. So they'd get piled on with 10 different organizations telling them we've got the password or we've got the way for you to unlock your ransom data. And you'd have to pay all of them in order to possibly get it to work. There's also been cases where the ransomware authors had bugs. I mean, we're not talking about it being a perfectly uh, above board situation. So even once it's been attacked, even once you've paid, there's no guarantee that you're going to get all of your data back. Some of this is being complicated as well by weaponized infrastructure tools. So the Shadow Brokers uh, is a, a group that's been uh, leaking out tools that were from the NSA. It were tools designed, you know, by a government entity for the purposes of, you know, espionage and actually working against other government entities. Some of these have been really high profile zero day attacks that basically make the known security protocols just fall aside. And so there was a major um, vulnerability in the SMB protocol, for example, in one of the recent shadow brokers dumps. And so these tools that come out here can, in you know, a matter of a couple hours, really change the game on you uh, in terms of your uh, attack surface. 
So whenever I'm thinking about this, you know, you, it's something that at a, at a organizational level, security infosec is its own um, function. It needs to be taken seriously. Whenever we're talking about databases, I can, I can take it down a little bit. You don't necessarily have to have, as a database administrator, full understanding of what's going on with the shadow brokers this week. But you need to be aware that all of these things are shifting, there are things going on. And so the, uh, the degree to which you keep your own domain, you know, tight and, and secure, it's really going to help you in the case that things uh, kind of get ripped out from under you. So I, I wanted to take a moment here before uh, moving on to talk about SQL Server specifically to actually have a bit of an open discussion here with our, with our panelists on uh, some of the considerations with database security. So, I, you know, gotten to this point, some of the things that we haven't mentioned, I wanted to talk about SQL injection as a, as a uh, vector. So um, this is SQL injection, obviously, is the way in which people uh, insert commands into a uh, database system by kind of malforming the inputs. Yeah, I actually met a guy at, uh, I think it was Andrews Air Force Base uh, about five years ago, a consultant that I was talking to him in the hallway, and we're just kind of sharing war stories, no pun intended, and uh, he mentioned that he had been brought in by someone to consult with a fairly high-ranking member of the military, and uh, and the guy asked him, well, how do we know you're good and what you do and this and that? And as he was talking to them, he used, he was on his computer, he'd gotten into the network, he used SQL injection to get into the email registry for that base and for those people. And he found the person's email that he was talking to. <laughs> he showed him his email on his machine. And the guy was like, how did you do that? I said, well, I used SQL injection. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's just five years ago. And it was at an Air Force base. Right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of context, this thing is still very real and it can be used with, with really terrifying effects. You know, I mean, I'd be curious to know uh, any war stories that Robin has on the topic, but all of these techniques are still valid. They're still used in many cases, and you know, it's just a question of educating yourself, right? Well, yes. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, it, it's possible to um, defend against SQL injection by doing the work. It, it's easy to understand why, uh, when the idea was invented and first proliferated, it's easy to understand why it was so good and successful because you could just um, you could just stick it in an input field on a web page and um, get it to return data for you, or get it to delete data in the database or I mean you could just inject um, SQL code to do that. But it, it, the the thing that interested me is that um, it is, you, you know, you would have to do a little bit of parsing of every piece of data that was entered, but it's quite possible to spot that someone's attempting to do that. And it's really, um, uh, and I think, it, you know, I think it's it's really because people still get away with this, and I think it's, it's just really strange that there hasn't been um, an easy way to um, uh, combat that, you know, that everybody could easily use. I, I mean, as far as I know, there hasn't. Vicky, has there? Well, actually, some of the hosted solutions, like uh, SQL Azure, I think, have some pretty good detection methods that are based on um, machine learning. And I think that that's probably what we're going to see in the future is something that they're trying to come up with a one-size-fits-all. I think the answer has been there isn't one-size-fits-all, but we do have machines that can learn what your size is and make sure that you're fitting to it, right? And, and so that, you know, if you have a false positive, it's because you're actually doing something unusual. It's not because you've had to go through and painstakingly uh, identify everything that your application might ever do. I think one of the reasons it's really still so prolific is that people do still rely on third-party applications and, and uh, applications coming from ISVs and and those are, you know, smeared out over time. So you talk about, you know, an organization which has bought an engineering application that was written in 2001 and they haven't updated it because there hasn't been any major functional changes since then and the original author of it was kind of 
you know, they were an engineer, they weren't a database security expert, they didn't do things the right way in, in the application, and they wind up being a vector. My understanding is that, I, I think it was the target data breach, the really large one, the, the attack vector had been via one of their air conditioning suppliers, right? So um, the, the problem of those third party um, you know, you can't, you can, if you own your own, you know, development shop, you can maybe have some of these rules in place. Doing it generically whenever, as an organization, you may have hundreds or even thousands of applications running which, with all their different profiles, I think that is where machine learning is going to come, come along and start helping us out. I have, uh, uh, my war story uh, was educational to me, is that I got to see a, a SQL attack, a SQL injection attack, and um, something that had never occurred to me is that use plain readable SQL, um, I do these things called these um, obfuscated T-SQL holiday cards I like to do, you know, you make this SQL look as com confusing as possible, just as con uh, there's an obfusc obfuscated C++ um, code contest that's been going on for, for decades now, and it's kind of the same idea. Well, so what you actually got was the SQL injection that was, you know, in an open, uh, string field, it closed the string, it put in a semicolon, and then it put an exec command that then had a series of numbers, and then it was basically using the, the casting command to cast those those numbers into uh, var binary, and then casting those in turn into uh, character values, and then executing that. So it's not like you got to see something that said uh, delete star dot from, you know, production table, it was actually stuffed into numeric fields that made it much harder to see. And even once you did see it to, to identify what was happening, it took some real uh, SQL chops to be able to figure out what was happening, by which time, of course, the work had already been done. Yeah, and one of the things is just a phenomenon in the, in the whole of the hacking world is that if somebody finds a weakness, and it happens to be in a piece of software that um, generally sells. But it's, I mean, you know, one of the, the early problems was the, the database password that you were given when a database was installed. And a lot of databases, in actual fact, was just a default. Uh, and a lot of DBIs simply never changed it. You know, and therefore, mm -hmm. if you managed to get into the network, then you could just try that password. And if it worked, well, you just, you know, won the lottery. Um, and the, the interesting thing is all of that information is, is you know, um, very efficiently and effectively circulated amongst the hack, uh, hacker communities and dark net websites. Um, and they know, you know, so they can pretty much do a sweep of what's out there, find a few instances and just um, automatically throw some hacking exploit at it and they're in. You know, and that's, I, I think that a lot of people who are at least on the periphery of all of this don't actually understand how fast the hacking network responds to a vulnerability. It just, it's just amazing. Yeah, that actually brings up another thing that I had wanted to mention before I move on, which is this notion of credential stuffing, which is something that's been popping up a lot, which is that once your credentials have been stolen for for somebody anywhere at any site, uh, those credentials are going to be attempted to be reused across the board. So if you are using duplicate passwords, say, or if, if your users are even, let's put it that way, uh, somebody might be able to get access via what appears to be a completely valid set of credentials. So let's say that I've used my same password at Amazon and at my bank and also at, you know, a forum and that forum software was hacked. Well, they have my username and my password and then they just use that same username over at Amazon, they use it over at the bank. And as far as the bank is concerned, it was a completely valid login. Now you can take nefarious actions via the completely authorized Access. So that kind of goes back again what I was saying about the internal breaches and the, the internal usages. If you've got people in your organization who are using their same password for internal access that they do for external access, you've got the possibility that someone's going to come in and impersonate you just via a breach at some other site that you don't even know about. And this data is disseminated very quickly. There are lists of I think that the most recent load to um, Have I Been Pwned by Troy Hunt, he said he had half a billion 
set of credentials, um, which is, you know, if you consider the number of people on the planet, that's a really large number of credentials that have been made available for, for credential stuffing. So I'm going to step a little bit deeper and talk about SQL Server security. Now, I want to say that I'm not going to try to give you everything you need to know to secure your SQL Server in the next 20 minutes. That, that seems a, a bit of a tall order. So to, to even start out, I, I want to say that there are groups online and, and resources online. You can certainly Google for, there are books, there are best practice documents from Microsoft. Uh, there is a uh, security virtual chapter for the Professional Association for SQL Server. They're at security.pass.org, and they have, um, I believe, monthly webcasts and recordings of webcasts uh, to kind of go over the real in-depth how to do SQL Server security. But these are some of the things that me speaking to you, you know, as, as data professionals, as IT professionals, as DBA, I, I want you to know, you need to know about with SQL Server security. So the first one is physical security. So um, like I said earlier, stealing physical media is still extremely common. And so the scenario I gave with a dev machine with a copy of your uh, database on the dev machine, which gets stolen, that's an extremely common vector. That's an, uh, a vector that you need to be aware of and try to take actions against. Uh, it's also true for backup security. So whenever you're backing up your data, you need to be backing it up encrypted. You need to be backing up to a secure location. A lot of times this data that was really well protected in the database, as soon as it starts getting out into periphery locations, onto dev machines, onto test machines, we get a little bit less uh, careful about the patching. We get a little bit less careful about the people who have access to it. And next thing you know, you've got, you know, unencrypted database backups stored on a public share in your organization available for uh, exploitation from a lot of different people. So think about physical security um, and, you know, just as simple as can somebody walk up and put a USB key into your uh, server, you should not be allowing that. Um, next item I want you to think about it is platform security. So up-to-date OS, up-to-date patches. Um, it's, it's very tiresome to hear people talking about staying on older versions of Windows, older versions of SQL Server, thinking that the only cost in play is the cost of the licensing upgrade, um, which, is, which is not the case. We are, with security, um, it's a stream that keeps going down the hill, and you, you know, as time goes on, more exploits are found, Microsoft, in, in this case, and, and other organizations, you know, other groups, as may, the case may be, they will update older systems to a point, and eventually they will fall out of support, and they won't be updating them anymore because it's just a never-ending process and uh, of maintenance. And so, you need to be on a supported OS, and you need to be up to date on your patches. And we've found recently, like with shadow brokers, that in some cases Microsoft may have insight into upcoming major security breaches prior to them being made public, you know, prior to disclosure. So, you know, don't let yourself get all twisted out of order with, you know, I'd rather, you know, not take the downtime. I'd rather, you know, you know, wait and read each one of them and decide. You may not know what the real value of it is until some weeks down the line after you find out why this patch occurred. So stay on top of that. Uh, you should have your firewall configured. Uh, it was shocking in the, the uh, SMB uh, breach how many people were running older versions of SQL Server with the firewall completely open to the Internet. So anybody could get in and do whatever they wanted to with their servers. You should be using a firewall. The fact that you have to occasionally configure the rules or make specific exceptions for the way that you're doing your business is an okay price to pay. Uh, you need to control the surface area in your database systems. You know, it, are you co-installing services or web servers like IIS on the same machine, uh, sharing the same disk space, sharing the same memory space as your uh, databases and your, your private data. Try not to do that, you know, try to isolate it, keep the surface area smaller so that you're not having to worry so much about making sure all of that is secure on top of the database. You know, you can kind of physically separate those platforms, separate them, give yourself a little bit of breathing room. Uh, you should not be having, you know, super admins running around everywhere able to have um, access to all your data. The OS admin accounts may not necessarily need to have access to your database uh, or to the underlying data in the database via encryption, which we'll talk about 
in a minute. And the access to the database files, you need to restrict that as well. It's kind of silly if you were to say, well, you know, somebody can't access these databases via the database Op, you know, the SQL Server itself won't allow them to access it, but if then they can go around, take a copy of the actual uh, MDF file, move it over someplace else, attach it to their own SQL Server, you haven't really uh, accomplished very much. Um, encryption. So, encryption is that famous two-way sword. So, there's a lot of different levels of encryption um, that you can do. Uh, at the OS level, in the contemporary way of doing things for SQL or for, for Windows is with BitLocker, uh, and at the database level, it's called TDE or Transparent Data Encryption. Uh, so, these are both ways to kind of keep your data encrypted at rest. Uh, if you want to keep your data encrypted. Um, kind of more comprehensively, you can do encrypted, uh, sorry, I've kind of stepped ahead. You can do encrypted connections so that whenever it's in transit, um, it's still encrypted so that if someone is listening in or man in the middle of attack, uh, you've got some protection of that data over the wire. Your backups need to be encrypted. Like, like I said, they might be accessible to others. Uh, and then if you want it to be en encrypted kind of in memory and, and during use, We've got column encryption, and then SQL 2016 has this notion of always encrypted, where it's actually encrypted on disk, in memory, all the way across the wire, all the way to the application that is actually making use of the data. Now, all this encryption is not free. There's CPU overhead. There's uh, sometimes, uh, you know, for the column encryption and the always encrypted case, there's implications on performance in terms of your ability to do seeks uh, on that data. However, this encryption, you know, if it's properly put together, then it means that if someone were to get access to your data, um, the the damage is greatly lessened because they were able to get it and then they're not able to do anything with it. However, this is also the way in which ransomware works is that someone goes in and turns these items on with their own certificate or their own password and you don't have access to it. So that's why it's important to make sure that you're doing this and you have access to it, but you're not giving it open for others uh, and attackers to do. And then security principles. I'm not going to belabor this point, but you need to make sure that you don't have, you know, every user running in SQL Server as, you know, super admin. Your developers may want it, you know, different users may want it. They're, they're frustrated by having to ask, ask for access for individual items, but you need to be um, diligent about that and even though it might be more complicated, give access to the objects and the databases and the schemas that are valid for ongoing work. And if there's a special case, maybe that means a special login. It doesn't necessarily mean an elevation of rights for the average case user. Um, and then there's regulatory compliance considerations which dovetail into this and in some cases might actually kind of go off in their own way. So there's HIPAA, SOX, PCI, there's all these different uh, considerations, and when you go through an audit, you're going to be expected to show that you are taking actions um, to to remain in compliance with this. And so this is this is a lot to keep track of. Um, I would say, you know, as a DBA to-do list, you're trying to ensure the, the security, physical encryption configuration. You're trying to make sure that access to that data is being audited for your compliance purposes, you're making sure that your sensitive columns, that you know what they are, where they are, which ones you should be encrypting and watching access to, and making sure that the configurations are in alignment with the regulatory guidelines that you are subject to. And you have to keep this all up to date as things are changing. So it's a lot to do. And uh, so if I were to leave it just there, I'd say, go do that. Um, but there's a lot of different tools for that. And uh, so if I may, in the last few minutes here, I wanted to show you some of the tools that we have at IDERA for that. Um, and the, the two I wanted to speak about today are uh, SQL Secure and SQL Compliance Manager. So SQL Secure is our tool to help identify kind of the, the configuration vulnerabilities, your security policies, your user permissions, your surface area configurations, and it has templates to help you comply with different regulatory frameworks. That by itself, that last line might be the reason for people to consider it because reading through these different regulations and identifying what those mean, you know, a PCI and then taking that all the way down to my SQL server in my shop, that's a lot of work. That's something that you could pay a lot of consulting money to do. We have gone and done that consulting. We've worked with 
uh, you know, the different uh, auditing companies, et cetera, to, to come up with what those templates are, something that's likely to pass an audit if these are in place. And then you can use those templates and see them uh, in your environment. We also have another kind of sister tool in the form of C SQL Compliance Manager. And this is uh, where SQL Secure is about uh, configuration settings. SQL Compliance Manager is about seeing what was done by whom, when. So it's auditing. So it allows you to monitor on activity as it's occurring and let you detect and track, you know, who is accessing things. Was somebody, you know, the the prototypical example being, you know, a celebrity checked into your hospital with somebody going and looking up their information just out of curiosity. Did they have a reason to do so? You can take a look at the audit history and see what was going on, who was accessing those records. And you can identify, this has tools to help you identify sensitive columns so that you're not necessarily having to read through and do that all yourself. So if I may, I'm going to go ahead and show you some of those tools here in these last few minutes. And uh, please don't consider this an in-depth um, demo. Uh, I am a product manager, not a sales engineer, and so um, I'm going to show you kind of some of the things that I think are relevant to this discussion. So this is our SQL Secure product. And as you can see here, I've got kind of this high-level report card. I ran this, uh, I think, uh, yesterday. And it shows me some of the things that are not set up correctly and some of the things that are set up correctly. So you can see there's there's quite a number, you know, over 100 different checks that we've done here. And I can see that um, my uh, backup encryption uh, on the backups I've been doing, I've, I've not been using backup encryption. My SA account, explicitly named SA account, is not disabled or renamed. Uh, the public server role has permission. So these are all things that I might want to look at changing. Um, I've got the uh, policy set up here. So like if I wanted to create a new policy uh, to apply to my servers, um, we've got all of these built-in policies. So I'll use an existing policy template. You can see I have CIS, HIPAA, PCI, SRR, uh, and, and going on. And we actually are in the process of continuously adding uh, additional policies based on the, the things people need out in the field. And you can also create a new policy. So if you know what your auditor is looking for, you can create it yourself. And then when you do so, uh, you can uh, choose amongst all of these different settings which, uh, what you need to have set. You know, in some cases you have some, uh, here, let me go back and find one of the pre-built ones. This is uh, convenient. I can choose, say, HIPAA. I've already got HIPAA. My bad. There's PCI. And then I, as I'm clicking around in here, I can actually see the external cross-reference to the section of the um, regulation that this is uh, related to. So that will help you later when you're trying to figure out why am I setting this, uh, why am I trying to look at this, what, what section is this related to. Uh, this also has a nice uh, tool in that it, it lets you uh, go in and browse your users. So one of the tricky things about um, exploring your user roles is that, actually I'm going to take a look here. So if I show permissions for my, let's see, let's pick a user here, show permissions. I can see the assigned permissions for this server, but then I can click down here and calculate the effective permissions, and it'll give me the full list based on, and so in this case, it's this admin, so it's not that exciting, but I could go through and pick uh, the different users and see what their effective permissions are uh, based on all of the different groups that they might have uh, belonged to. If you've ever tried to do this on your own, it can actually be a bit of a hassle to figure out, okay, this user is a member of these groups and therefore it has access to these things uh, via groups, et cetera. Um, so the way that this product works is it takes snapshots. And so it's, it's really a, not a very difficult process of taking the snapshot of the server on a regular basis. And then it keeps those snapshots over time 
so you can compare for changes. And uh, so this is not a kind of a continuous monitoring in the traditional sense of like a performance monitoring tool. This is something that you might have set up to run once per night, once per week, however often you think is valid, uh, so that then whenever you're doing the analysis and you're looking at it here, you're actually just working within our tool. You're not connecting back to your server so much. So this is a pretty nice little tool to, to work with for uh, getting in compliance with those, those kind of static settings. The other tool I want to show you is our Compliance Manager tool. And so I've, Compliance Manager is going to monitor in a more continuous way, and uh, it's going to see who's doing what on your server uh, and allow you to take a look at it. So what I've done here in the last you know couple hours or so, I, I, I've actually tried to create some little problems. So here I've got, you know, whether it's a problem or not, I might need to know about it. Somebody has actually created a login and added it to a server role. So if I go in and take a look at that, uh, I can see, I should, I guess I can't right click there. I can see kind of what's going on. So this is my dashboard and I can see I've got, I had a number of failed logins a little earlier today. Uh, I had a bunch of security activity, DDL activity. So let me go over to my audit events and, and take a look. Um, here I've got my audit events grouped by category and target object. So if I take a look at that security from earlier, I can see demo new user, this create server login occurred. And I can see that the login SA created this demo new user ac uh, account here at uh, 2.42 p.m. And then uh, I can see that in turn, add login to server, this demo new user was added to the server admin group, they were added to the setup admin group, they were added to the sysadmin group. So that's something that, you know, I would want to know had happened. I've also got it set up so that the uh, uh, sensitive columns in my uh, tables are being tracked so I can see who has been accessing it. So here I've got a couple selects that have occurred on my person table uh, from AdventureWorks and I can take a look and see that user SA, on the AdventureWorks table did the select top 10 star from person dot person. So maybe in my organization, I don't want people to do select stars from uh, person dot person, or I'm expecting only certain users to do so, and so I'm going to see this in here. So what you need in terms of your uh, auditing, uh, we can set that up based on the, the, the framework. and. Uh, this is a bit more of an intensive tool. It is using SQL trace or SQL X events, uh, depending on, on the version. Um, and it's something that you're going to have to have some headroom on your server to accommodate, but it's one of those things kind of like insurance. It would be nice if we didn't have to have car insurance. It would be a cost that we wouldn't have to take. But if you do have a server where you need to keep track of who's doing what, you might have to have a little bit of extra headroom and a tool like this to do this. Whether you're using our tool or you're, you're rolling it yourself, uh, you're ultimately going to be responsible for having this information for regulatory compliance purposes. So like I said, not an in-depth demo, just kind of a quick little summary. I also wanted to show you a quick little free tool uh, in the form of this uh, SQL column search, uh, which is something that you can use to identify what, serve, what columns in your environment uh, appear to be sensitive information. So um, we have a number of uh, search configurations where it's looking for the, you know, different names of columns that are commonly uh, containing sensitive data. And then I've got this whole list of them that have been identified. I've got 120 of them. And then I exported them here so I can make use of them later to say, let's go look and make sure that I'm tracking access to the middle name on to a person dot person or sales tax rate, et cetera. So I know we're getting kind of right at the end of our time here. And uh, that is all that I actually had to show you. So any questions for me? I do have a couple of good ones for you. Let me throw this mm -hmm. up here. One of the attendees was asking a couple of really good questions, one of which uh, is asking about the performance tax. So I know it, it varies from solution to solution, but do you have any general idea of what the performance tax is for using IDERA security tools? 
So on the SQL Secure, like I said, it, it's very low. It's just going to take some occasional snapshots. Um, and even if you have them running pretty often, it's getting kind of static information about uh, settings. And so it, it, it's very low, uh, almost negligible. In terms of Compliance Manager, it is good. Like one you know, if, if I had to give a per percent number, yeah, one percent or lower. It, it's it's basic information on the order of using SSMS and going to the security tab and expanding things. Hmm. Um, on the compliance side, it, it's much higher. That's why I said that it needs a little headroom. It's sort of like um, it's well beyond what you have in terms of performance monitoring. Now, I don't want to scare people away from it. Uh, the, the trick with uh, compliance monitoring and with auditing is to make sure you're only auditing what you're going to be taking action on. So once you filter down to say, hey, I, I want to know when people access these particular tables and I want to know whenever people access, uh, take these particular actions, then it's going to be based on how often are those things happening and how much data are you generating. If you say, I want the full SQL text of every select that ever happens on any of these tables, that's just going to be possibly gigabytes and gigabytes of data that is having to be parsed by SQL Server, stored, moved to our product, et cetera. If you keep it down to a, a – it's also going to be more information that you can probably deal with. If you take it down to a smaller set so that you're getting a couple hundred events per day, um, then that's obviously much lower. So really, in, in some ways, the sky's the limit. If you turn on all settings on all monitoring for everything, then yes, it, it's going to be a you 50% know, performance hit. But if you're going to turn it on to kind of a more moderate, considered level, I would, I would maybe eyeball 10%. Uh, it really is one of those things that is going to be very dependent on your workload. Yeah, right. There's another question about hardware and vendors, hardware vendors getting into the game and really collaborating with software vendors. And I answered through the, the Q&A window. I know of one particular case uh, of Cloudera working with Intel, where Intel made that huge investment in them, and part of the calculus was that Cloudera would get early access to chip design and thus be able to bake security into the chip level of the architecture, which is pretty impressive. But it, nonetheless, it's something that's still going to get out there and still can be exploited by both sides. Do you know of any trends or any tendencies of hardware vendors to collaborate with software vendors on security protocol? Yeah, actually, I believe that um, Microsoft has collaborated um, in order to have some off, uh, like the memory space for some of the encryption uh, work is actually happening on separate chips on motherboards um, that are separate from, you know, your main memory so that some of that stuff is physically separated. And I believe that that actually was something that came from Microsoft in terms of going out to the vendors to say, can we come up with a way to make this or, you know, basically it's unaddressable memory. I can't, through a buffer overflow, get to this memory because it's not even there, you know, in, in some sense. So I, I do know that some of that is happening. Yeah. Well, that's that's going to be obviously the, the really big vendors, most likely. Yeah, I, I'm I'm curious to, to watch for that. I mean, I, and maybe, Robin, if you have a quick second, I'd be curious to know your experience over the years because, again, security in terms of hardware, in terms of the actual material science that goes into what you're putting together from the vendor side, that information can go to both sides, and it, it theoretically would go to both sides fairly quickly. So is there some way to use the hardware more carefully from a design perspective to to bolster security? What do you think? Robin, are you on mute? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm just kind of pondering the question. It's, I mean, it, it, I mean to be honest, I haven't got an opinion. It's, it, it's an area that I haven't looked at in um, significant depth. So I'm kind of, um, you know, I can invent an opinion, but I don't really know. It's, I prefer things to be secure in software. I mean, it's just the way that I, you know, it's the way that I play, basically. Yeah. Well, folks, we burned through an hour and change here. Big thanks to Vicki Hart for her time and attention, for all of your time and attention. We appreciate you showing up for these things. It's a big deal. It's not going to go away anytime soon. It is a cat and mouse game. It's going to keep on going and going and going. And so we're thankful that some companies are out there focused on 
enabling security, but as, uh, as Vicki even alluded to and talked about a bit in her presentation, at the end of the day, it's people in organizations who need to think very carefully about these phishing attacks, that kind of social engineering, and uh, hold on to your laptop. Don't leave it at the coffee shop. <laughs> Change your passwords. Do the basics, and you're going to get 80% of the, of the way there. So with that, folks, we're going to bid you farewell. Thank you once again for your time and attention, and we'll catch up to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.